It's the end of the year, and as you guys probably are, are catching on to already, I want to do a top 10 countdown of the 10 most popular podcast episodes that we've released, and today is number two. So in second spot, it was episode number 148, released on the 21st of June, 2021, with guest Heschel Mangle. So he did his first deal episode at the time, uh, we talked about, uh, it actually wasn't his first deal, but we talked about a deal that he had closed and very, very good episode and hope you guys enjoy it. Welcome to the Dire and Apartment Investor Podcast. I'm your host, Brian Briscoe. I'm very excited for today's show. It's one of our first deal series episodes and we have Heschel Mangle on the line with us today who recently closed on, where is it, where is it, where is it? Who recently closed on a 32 unit apartment complex in Cincinnati, Ohio for $1.5 million. And it was a B-class apartment. So you know, that said, Heschel, welcome to the show. Thank you, Brian. It's good to be back. Yeah. You know, and this is, this is interesting. You were one of the first people to come on the show. Um, it's been almost a year. Um, you were episode 19, which was a long running number one, you know, as far as downloads for this show is the first, first one to hit 300 downloads, first one to hit 400 downloads. And the first episode hit 500 downloads. So, you know, something about you is magical. So thanks a lot for being on the show again. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I wish I can take credit for that one. But that uh, Joseph, who was the uh, the lead on that one, was dropping insights the entire time and, and yeah. absolutely gold. So, yeah, credit to him. Yeah, I mean, that that was absolutely pure gold. I was taking notes. I mean, um, you know, we, we've come a little ways ourselves since that, that episode recorded. But uh, – I was definitely taking notes and I re-listened to that one a couple of times just to uh, just to you know hear what he had said again about scaling and growing your business. But uh, that said, uh, let, let's talk a little bit more about that episode in detail. What, what are some key takeaways you had from that and and how did that help you? Yeah, so some things that I took out from that talk with uh, with Joseph and he's been so gracious with his time as well, even post that and continuing the conversation. Um, but he definitely opened my eyes to the idea of just thinking bigger. Mm -hmm. um, you know, jumping into bigger opportunities and just open your box and open your mindset a little bit and think bigger and, yeah. and be able to grow bigger. Um, the way that he scaled has been incredible. Um, and to just really know your place, understand your strengths, and then fill the rest of the gaps with great people. Yeah. And both of those, I think, points, when you bring them together, um, really allowed me to continue to operate in that way and just continue to grow and have that mindset of continuing trying to get bigger. Yeah, well, well, one gem that I remember from it is, is you asked him a question about, um, you know, doing doing stuff yourself versus having other people do it. And, and his answer was simple. It's like, don't start. He's like, don't start doing that stuff. He's like, have somebody else do that from the beginning. And that, that's something that I mean, it's been a year from that conversation. And I probably haven't listened to that episode in you know about six months, but something that I still remember, he just said, hey, just don't start it. He's like, if if it's something that you're going to offload eventually or something you're going to outsource eventually and, and you're not good at it, don't start doing it yourself. And that's, that's something that uh, helped, helped me as well. I think that was the, uh, um, the nail in the coffin for me to actually outsource getting my podcast edited because I was doing all that stuff myself and spending a lot of time on it. And I'm like, you know what? He's right. I shouldn't have even started this. I should have outsourced it from the beginning, but uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, that's it. Let's, let's talk a little bit about you about you, and uh, tell us a little bit about your background and what got you into multifamily. Sure. So um, my background, I'm born and bred here in Cincinnati, Ohio, mm -hmm. um, left at about high school age um, and did a, made a couple stops around the world. Um, ultimately, got married and, and settled in New York. Um, mm -hmm. While I was living in New York and I was actually a teacher at the time is when I first um, got my really my introduction um, into this whole space in general um, and just went aggressively in trying to learn as much as I can about the industry. Um, did have a couple of friends that were in the, that were in this industry and just hearing from them about, you know, the type of opportunities that it brought them and the lifestyle that it brings them really intrigued me. Um, so just went aggressively from that point to learn as much as I can speak to as many people as I can. Um, started doing a couple of smaller projects um, while I was still living in New York, operating in Cincinnati, which is where I'm from, um, and then ultimately made the move back to Cincinnati as we were able to grow it out a little bit and be able to scale a little bit better. Nice. 
Nice. Yeah. And I remember um, when you came on the episode last time you had accumulated, I think 55 total units. Um, you know, a couple, if I remember right, a couple, a couple small multifamily and a couple larger ones. Can you, can you tell us what your portfolio was like then and what it's like now? Yeah. So at that point there was, um, if I remember correctly as well, it was a couple of single families and then uh, two apartment buildings. Mm -hmm. um, that was the bulk of it. Uh, since then, it's been about a year, I, say, I would say. Um, we've closed on three other properties since then, and we're getting ready to close one here in about a week on another, awesome. on another multifamily. Yeah. Oh, wow. Congratulations. You guys have been extremely busy, and that's, that's great. So, um, so let, let's talk about your, your why, your big burning why. I think this is an important thing because it's, it's what drives us. So what is your big burning why? Yeah, so the why is is uh, my family mm -hmm. and uh, the opportunities for my family. Um, just case in point, um, I was a little bit late to today's meeting, and that was mm -hmm. due to uh, me taking my my daughter to school today. Um, she was feeling a little bit unwell and, and had to be taken to school late. And just the opportunity for me to be able to be available mm -hmm. um, and there for my family whenever it's needed uh, is really my why, and that's really that like that drives it every single every. every Every day and really every decision I try to make within the business is catering to me being available uh, to my family. And that's really what's most important. Um, and at the same token is um, being able to have the opportunity to, to give and give back to organizations and, and um, issues that I believe in mm -hmm. uh, is really important to me as well. And when I have the opportunity to be able to give back, it's, it's, uh, it's special. Yeah, I love that. I love that. And that that's that aligns very closely to, to what my why is. I mean, um, I, I started this business three years ago to be able to live, you know, close to family, you know, and I'm now in Idaho Falls, which is, you know, close to family. So, you know, we're, we're about two blocks away from two of my wife's sisters, you know, slightly different directions, but, uh, you know, we're, we're close to family. And it was something that uh, with my, my W2 job, I wouldn't have been able to do. And that big burning why for me, it, it really fueled me. So, um, you know, being, being available to your kids is, is huge. Um, and I know they'll thank you for it, you know, many, many years from now, um, probably not when they're teenagers, but, uh, you know, hopefully when they're in their thirties, they'll, they'll reach back and thank you for it. But, uh, so let, let's talk about, uh, this particular deal itself. Let's, uh, so 30, 32 units Cincinnati, and I know it's in the same Metro you're in. So let's talk about how you found the deal. First of all. So I found the deal through a broker that I've built a relationship with over the last few years. Um, he had actually brought me this deal. He brought me a different deal mm -hmm. originally uh, that was owned by the same owner. And uh, we decided we weren't going to pursue that opportunity. But in conversation, we realized that there was actually another property that he owned um, that he wasn't really interested in selling at the time. But uh, mm -hmm. we were able to continue to you know stay in touch and, and follow up with that. And eventually we were able to uh, come to terms and secure the contract for this property, which is one that we ultimately closed on. Nice. Um, nice. Now, now how long, how long did you know this broker before, you know, he brought you that first deal? It's been at least two years. Mm -hmm. um, and we, uh, we always stay in touch. Uh, you know, we're always staying in touch in terms of what opportunities are out there. And uh, we've done a couple of, of projects and worked together on some other things in the past. Um, but this is the first multifamily deal that we actually closed together. Uh, but we've, we, you know, always staying in touch and in contact over the last couple of years. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, that's a big thing. I mean, brokers, you know, it's, it's nice to have a lot of brokers and it's, I, I think it's kind of hard for the newer investor to, to get, um, to build that broker relationship. I think a lot of brokers are closed off, but, you know, basically two years since you knew him before, you know, you close your first big multifamily deal. And I, I don't think that's atypical. I think there's a lot of people who you know, it takes a long time to build those relationships of trust, you know, and that's, that's something for a lot of people that's a struggle at first is, is to, to be able to get that, that relationship with the broker. Um, now, what, what other type of stuff did you do? I mean, whatever you said, you had other business with him. What other type of stuff did you do with him? Um, we've worked, well, I actually was involved with a single family deal with him as well. Mm -hmm. um, and we've done some work on a couple of a couple of rehabs uh, okay. i'm trying to remember exactly which property it was um and there was another deal actually that we were working on a large multifamily deal that we 
almost secured the contract. And then it was kind of tucked, tucked away from under us at the last minute. Mm -hmm. um, but we've definitely had, you know, cross paths and done a, a few different things over the last couple of years. Okay. All right. So, so all, all good things, you know, and, and I mean, the fact that you had an LOI in and almost got a contract previously, you know, he, he knew that you guys were, were serious. He knew you were ready. You had to, and, and in your case, you're, you're different than, than people who come on the first deal because this is not your first deal where you you had a lot of experience prior to, to kind of gain that credibility with the broker. But uh, so broker brought you a deal, wasn't the right one for you. And you ended up, you know, working with the broker and the owner to, to get another one of the owner's properties under contract. Right. So, yeah. All right. So, so tell us about the property. Tell us about the business plan. So it's, 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 uh, it's 32 units. Now the actual, the bulk of the property is actually 30 units and there's a duplex uh, a few minutes away. That was, that was, you know, included as part of the sale. Um, and I do want to say that although this wasn't my first deal, mm -hmm. um, there are aspects of it that, that are the first, and there's always things that you can learn first from each deal. And there's, yeah. I'm sure there'll be things on every deal that will be the first time for that deal. Uh, the big thing for me in this deal was it's the first time that, um, that I was securing the debt, mm -hmm. um, you know, with my own balance sheet, uh, which ultimately, you know, we, we ran into some issues towards the end and mm -hmm. definitely some things that we learned, uh, for the future. Yep. Um, but it was, it's, it's, it's a huge step to being able to continue to scale and, you know, bring in new investors and partners, um, right. once you can capitalize on that ability. Nice. Nice. So, um, it, it's a B class. It's a 30 unit. Um, is, is there renovations? Is this a value add plan? Is it a buy and hold? What's, what's your play on this one? Yeah. So the, the, the beauty of this property is that it was cash flowing, uh, mm -hmm. from day one. And that's what we are looking to do with our properties. We want it to be cash flowing on day one. Mm -hmm. Um, and at the same time, be able to continue to add value and, and give, you know, a higher rate of return for our investors. Um, mm -hmm. and then the, the third metric that we look at before buying the property is that at the end of it, our entire basis with after renovations and everything we do is going to be below, you know, the actual property value. So we want to be able to have it cash flowing right away, increase the value and be in it for less than what it's worth. Nice. Um, and this one hits all those three boxes uh, where it was, you know, a very stable cash flowing property right away. Um, we've started going in there and already making improvements both on the interiors and exteriors. Um, adding value to the existing residents and future residents. Yeah. And uh, ultimately we'll, we'll be in it for less than what its value is. No, no, I, I like that because the, the things you say, the things that you just said are, are things that in, bring good returns, but also mitigate risk, you know? So, so you're looking at this from both angles you want the basis, you know, after everything's said and done, you want the basis to be lower than the property price. You know, that that's nice for, for two reasons. Number one, like I said, it just mitigates the risk. I mean, there, there's low risk there of loss of money. You buying a cash flowing asset, you know, once again, very low risk of loss because you know the cash is already coming in and you're already able to cover your debt service and hopefully pay your investors back a little bit. And then the value add portion, you know, if you do that properly and you're looking at the comps properly, um, you know, that's that's a way where you guys can force the appreciation. And what I didn't hear you say, and I love this, is that you're banking on market appreciation. You know, it'll, it'll probably happen, but, you know, the, the three things you said are entirely under your control. And, you know, so you're, you're mitigating risk and you're able to provide solid returns. And if the market appreciates, it likely will. You know, that's just icing on the cake. So, so good on that one. Good, good. All right. So let's, let's talk about the, uh, the capital raise. How much did you raise for this and how much did you uh, contribute yourself? Yes, we raised about $500,000. Okay. Um, uh, 50 of that was from myself and, okay. and, and 450 came from our partners. Um, and that was, uh, you know, a process of, of, of raising the capital and, um, you know, thankfully, we started at a place where we already had a mutual understanding and mm -hmm. mutual respect for each other. Um, and that makes it a lot easier to, to run a deal when you know who your partners are and everybody's comfortable working with each other. Um, so there was no real, you know, sales pitch in terms of having to sell myself or the, or the way, you know, that we would operate the deal because we all had that common ground already. Mm -hmm. um, so 
you know, that that's really been helpful for me and and also in the in future deals and the deal that, that we're closing now and and probably for the foreseeable future um, is the way I'll go about it. It's just people within my existing network or, you know, an existing investor telling their friend or their relative, hey, I've done this deal with them. You know, I think this is something you would be interested in um, and kind of letting the deal speak for itself. Yeah. Yeah. And that's that's the very important point. You know, you you had credibility with these people prior to asking them to invest. And I, I think, you know, a common mistake that, that a lot of people make is they have the idea that if you have a good deal, the money will come. I think it's the opposite. You know, you have to have the relationship with investors. You have to have that credibility with investors before you pitch them that good deal or that money's not going to come. So so you you had fostered relationship with people. They trusted you. And something that I also think is important is, um, you know, you're putting your own money into the deal, you know, so a $500,000 raise, you've got 10% of the total capital stack there. And you can basically say, Hey, I'm investing $50,000 of my own money. Will you invest with me? And that's, that's a lot different than I've got a project and I want you to invest. Will you please give me some money to invest? You know, so, so good, good. I think there's, there's a lot, a lot of little gold nuggets there in what you said. Um, you know, fostering the relationships and then being able to um, capitalize on the relationships you'd already built and the trust and confidence you'd already built with people. Yeah. And I think if, if for, for someone who's listening to this and, and maybe thinking like, oh, I've never done a deal before. How do I build that credibility? Credibility is not only built from, I think, a previous deal that you might have done with this person or, or something else. You know, mm-hmm. you can build credibility and trust uh, in many ways. Sometimes you can even build credibility and trust from deals that you did not do, which mm-hmm. is very important. And I, I think that we don't see it enough um, of people talking about deals that they didn't do. Mm-hmm. And that builds trust as well. When they see that you're, you're honest in your underwriting, you're honest in your reporting, and you're explaining to people why this deal you didn't think would be a good opportunity for them to get into. You know, that builds trust as well. And then, you know, in your everyday just relationships and the way you, you deal with people and the way you conduct your lifestyle, um, you know, builds that trust and credibility as well. So, you know, it's not, it's not only from, oh, I've done 10 deals, look at me, trust me. Because, yeah. you know, and there are unfortunately probably people that have done 10, 20 deals that are not trustworthy. So I would say, you know, look past just the amount of experience that you may think you have or don't have and, and look for ways, um, really just be, you know, honest and, and personable and, and ultimately you'll end up building the trust. Yeah, yeah, I think, I think that's huge. I mean, especially for, for the, the the newcomer, you know, it's, it's something where you can take your previous life experiences, your previous life skills, your previous life relate relationships and apply them to, you know, the multifamily, the, the apartment investing business. And that, that's something that you, you said very, very eloquently, you know, you can, you know, just be a good person, be trustworthy. And that by itself is going to go a long way in being able to attract capital when it's time to do that. So, yeah. Uh, let's let's talk about uh, closing. You mentioned earlier there were some hitches with with closing. Uh, let's talk about the closing process, uh, some of the hitches, and how you guys overcame those. Yeah, so the closing process was going uh, quite smooth, actually. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, I want to say about three days after closing was scheduled, um, we get a message from the lender like, "Hey, actually, we need to change some things," and that. Uh, threw quite a wrench into the deal. Um, mm-hmm. We had quite a, a lot of, uh, of my own personal money already um, locked up in the deal and in, in earnest money and due mm-hmm. diligence money and legal fees and everything else. Um, and, you know, they, they wanted to come at the end after we were meant to close and, and changing terms. Um, and I don't know exactly why that occurred. Um, you know, the, the entire process was a transparent process. Mm-hmm. I think ultimately um, there are many different departments and, and, and levels and hierarchy within a bank structure and uh, things can be a little bit of broken telephone. I think when you go up and down the totem pole Yeah, right. right. Um, and, you know, there's only one level that's the face of the deal that's communicating with you as the, as the customer mm-hmm. and many levels beyond that, that uh, don't interface with the customer. And right. Um, especially when you're dealing with a bank that's relationship based, it's, you want, it's important to have relationships with the people that are ultimately making the decisions. Yeah. Um, now what, what terms, what terms did they change and how did that affect, you know, you going forward? I mean, were they significant enough to make you pause and say, 
can we still do this deal or what, what type of what type of terms did they change on this? Yeah, there were definitely moments where there was pause of can we still do mm -hmm. this deal? And, you know, I reiterated to them and really all the parties the entire time is at the end of the day, I'm a fiduciary for my investors money. And yep. if it's not going to be good for them. We're going to walk away. You know, I, personally, I had money in the deal that I would have lost. Mm -hmm. um, but at the end of the day, they had to understand that the, the deal has to work for those who have financial interest in the deal and for, and for those that I'm representing. And if it doesn't work for them, we can't do it. And I, ultimately, I think they appreciated that. And, and we were able to continue to, you know, finagle around and negotiate both with them and the, and the owner to get the mm -hmm. deal done in, in a manner that worked for everybody. Um, but there definitely were moments throughout it that um, where we weren't sure if the deal was going to get, was going to get done. Yeah. Um, they wanted, they wanted a lot more. Um, they wanted more capital, first of all, mm -hmm. um, and a reserve account. Um, they wanted some extra contingencies mm -hmm. um, because being that this was the first deal that I was guaranteeing on my own, they, yep. they decided they wanted a lot, a lot more contingencies and, um, you know, I don't even know exactly exactly what, um, but ultimately we were able to come to the agreement as to, you know, how much we should put down in reserve, um, you know, what other contingencies were going to be and how we yeah. were going to kind of operate the, the deal going forward. Um, and then, you know, they, they wanted to do another appraisal and another report and another report. Um, so that kind of took a bit. Mm -hmm. And at that point, a lot, of it, a lot of it was just time because at that point we were out of contract. Yep. And the owner at that point um, said like, you know, the contract is over, you know, he's taking the earnest money. Yep. Um, and he's like, listen, the deal is over. Um, if you want to get the deal back, you know, meet me at this time in this place. We'll have a half hour chat and at the end of it, we'll know are we closing or not. Uh, you know, let's lay it all on the table. Um, and we did that. And he was very responsive and appreciative mm -hmm. of me showing up and, and being honest with exactly what was going on. And I think that calmed him down as to our ability to close at that point. And uh, so once we were able to get him back in, um, the investors had to had to have buy in again, because at that point, the bank had, had, had requested that those investors should uh, give them some more information about their background as well. Mm -hmm. um, so we had their buy-in and, and at that point, you know, then we were able to close. All right. Nice. Yeah. So, so yeah, significant hitches. I mean, you, this basically made the deal fall out of contract and I mean, you you risked your earnest money. I mean, they, they call it risk capital for a reason because it's always at risk. I mean, you've paid some money for the due, due, due diligence. You probably paid loan application fees and obviously the earnest money, which the, the seller is entitled to, you know, if you don't close. So, there, there's obviously, you know, lots of risk there, but end of the day, you were able to you know, bring all parties to the table and Hey, let's get this thing done. And what, what, what I think, I mean, most sellers, you know, and I, I've been, you know, a seller a couple of times, but most sellers, you know, they, they are obviously interested in, in getting the best price possible, but they don't want to be strung out either. You know, and that, that's, that's kind of a big thing. You know, if, if you can't close in the contract period, you know, the question that they're going to be asking themselves is, if I give them another chance, are they going to be able to close it? You know, because the last thing they want is to have their property tied up for an extended period of time. So sounds like you went back to the table with them. You convinced them that you're able, you're going to be able to close and got this across the finish line. Yeah. So, you know, a couple of things there, and that was really well how you put it all together, but the understanding that there are multiple parties involved and having to yeah. keep all the pieces glued together, you know, from the lender to the owner, to the investors, you know, there's the insurance company, the legal title, everybody just keeping all the people involved um, was super important and being transparent with everybody yeah. about exactly what's going on was super important. And from the owner side of it, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, and, and it added another level that they were actually relying on this clothing for a 1031 that, that, that the owner was doing. So, you know, they needed to be sure that this was going to close because they have time frames, you know, mm -hmm. and they have, you know, a, a time that they have to keep to. So just making sure that everybody is, is aware of what's going on and, and keeping everybody involved and uh, it, it was key to being able to actually bring this back to closing. All right. Well, congratulations on getting that across the finish line and, and negotiating the, the actual finish on that one. So, um, so let's talk about uh, the first step after closing. Um, you closed in April, it's June. How have things gone so far? Yeah. I mean, thank God it's gone really well. 
the first thing that, that we do after closing um, is we have a questionnaire we give to all the residents mm -hmm. and we want their feedback. So we want, you know, we want their feedback as to what is good, what isn't good, why they like living there, what would they want to see changed. Um, and we let them tell us uh, kind of what they would have wanted to see out of the, out of the property and out of the mm -hmm. community that they live in. Um, so obviously, as we do due diligence, you know, we're going through and, and creating our own list of um, different improvements we want to make on the property, both interior and exterior. Um, and then we take their list as well. And we are able to get a good idea as to um, both from our perspective, as well as current residents and locals and what their perspective is. Um, and, you know, thankfully, we've been able to, to go ahead and really implement that plan so far really well. Um, the bulk of it is, has actually been so far exterior improvements, you know, uh, power washing, landscaping, um, really making the exterior, you know, putting up a new, a new sign, uh, you know, the rebranding of it and um, cleaning the uh, and filling in, you know, potholes in the, in the driveway, things that the residents have really been able to see that, that, you know, they've come in and have, have been able to deliver on, on, on what they have told us they were going to do. Um, and they're listening to us and people see, they drive by, they come by and they see that it's, it's being taken care of well. Yeah. Um, and then at the same time, interior improvements. So there were, you know, if there were pressing needs from individual residents that I told us that these, you know, they've had these issues or that issues. So those were the first things that were, that we were able to tackle on the interiors, um, just fixing, you know, maintenance issues that had, that have built up over time. Um, and then the third part of it is then rehabbing, you know, the vacant units and improving those to be able to get higher rents. Yeah, really nice there. And there, there, there's something I really like. You guys involved your tenants, you know, and this is that there's something that, that can be said about building a community. You know, if, if your tenants are involved, they're more likely to renew, you know, and that's that's huge from from a bottom line standpoint. I mean, number one, it helps build community. You know, if you have tenants who've been there, they make relationships with their neighbors and it makes them less likely to leave. And for your bottom line, I think the, the most expensive thing that happens, you know, operating an apartment building is when people move out. Because when people move out, you're going to spend, for number one, you're going to have an empty unit with nobody paying rent. And number two, there are going to be turn costs. You know, you're going to go in, you're going to, you're spending costs cleaning, you're going to spend costs fixing up minor things. And, you know, if you can get the tenant to stay in for a year or sign a renewal, that saves you a lot of money and keeps keeps money coming in as well. So, you know, involving your tenants, I think it's a smart move. Um I think the curb appeal goes a long way to showing the tenants that uh, that you guys are going to make that you care about the place. You know, you want to make it look better, and and they're going to see that immediately. You know, they're going to see that it's it's getting better, and once again, that makes it more likely to stay. I don't I don't think curb appeal, you know, directly contributes to your NOI by bringing more money in, but it definitely contributes by you know making people a little more um, likely to stay there longer. And by the way, can you hear my kids upstairs? They're loud to me. Very, very faintly. Okay, good, good. That'll, that'll probably come out in the editing. But uh, um, <laughs> yeah, my kid's room is right above me. And my, my daughter will edit this side, no doubt. But uh, all right, cool. So, all right. Um, we hit it's first a good of life. I know, right? Yeah. Um, hold on a second. All right. Just yelled upstairs for her to be quiet. So, all right, here we go. Um, so we're going to pick this back up again. We talk first steps after closing. Next step is going to be what's next for you. So that's how I'll open it. All right. So, so we talked about the, the project, you know, how you closed on it and, and what you've done since then. So the question I always like to ask everybody is what's next for you? Where are you going from here? Yes, yeah, so we're continuing to, uh, to try to build um, both obviously on that deal as well as another deal. As I mentioned, we are closing another deal here in about a, in about a, a week or two, hopefully before the end of the month. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so we're continuing to look for for these type of deals that that you know meet that that criteria. If it's it's cash flowing, there's there's room for value to be added, and that we can be in for less than its value. Um, so those those three are are really important for the new deals that we're looking for. Um, and really, as, as Joseph had, had told us, you know, a year ago, we're trying to think bigger. Um, the last couple of deals we've been in have been about this size, you know, the yep. 30, 35 units. And we're trying to, to think bigger and, and be able to scale bigger and, and look for bigger properties. 
um, yeah, that's that's where we hope to be heading. Yeah, love it, love it. Yeah, and and you got a really good base. You know, a couple of you know twenty thirty unit properties. Uh, I'm guessing your unit count right in right now is you know triple digit. You know, low triple digits. Um, so being able to get go go to that next step, um, you got a very solid base to be able to to push the envelope a little more. All right. Yeah. So, what advice would you give an aspiring investor who is you know maybe six to twelve months out from getting their first deal? Sure. Um, network. You know, build relationships with people. That's ultimately what drives the business. Is is uh, you get out there. You know, now you can get out there even more and meet people. Um, show your face build relationships, build real relationships, um, you know, be consistent, I think is a huge thing. There's, there's, this business has ups and downs and there's no guarantees from one day to the next. Every day is different. Um, just try to go out there, be consistent um, and, and find common ground with, with service people around you, with other people in the industry, uh, where you can add value to people and, and ultimately just build relationships with people. Yeah. Yeah. That's, um, that's solid. I mean, it's definitely a relationship business, you know, on, on all aspects, you know, from, from you to your investors, from you to your lender, from you to the seller, the brokers, from even the service providers, the property managers and everybody else involved. It's a team sport and you've got to keep that team together. So building the network, maintaining those relationships is, is huge. Great, great tip. All right. And last question, how can listeners learn more about you? Um, I'm available on LinkedIn. Mm-hmm. At Heschel Mangel is my handle. Uh, that's probably the uh, the best way to go about finding me. All right. Sounds good. And we'll put a link to that in the show notes. So if anybody's interested in reaching out to him, you know, tap, you know, tap show notes, swipe and, and tap the, the link to his LinkedIn profile. And incidentally, that's where, you know, Heschel and I first met was on LinkedIn. I, I think he responded to a post I, I put out, a feeler I put out, you know, a year ago, you know, looking for, for people who wanted to come on podcasts. So um, that said, you know, Heschel, thank you so, so much for coming on the show. This was great. And it's it been great catching up and seeing what you've done in the last year. So thank you very much. Hey, if you like that episode, make sure to subscribe. But more importantly, if you haven't joined our multifamily educational community yet, which we call a tribe of Titans, you are missing out. Get 30 days free by clicking the link in the description to this episode or go to the tribe of Titans.info and we'll see you there. Yeah.